So now let's talk pricing models in AWS. AWS has four different pricing models. There is pay as you go, where you pay for what you use. You remain agile because you can start and stop and delete resources whenever you want, responsive, and you can scale to meet demands as demand happens. There's also a model where you save when you reserve. So this is to minimize risk and to get a predictable budget and to comply with long-term requirements. For example, we can do instance reservations for EC2, DynamoDB, ElastiCache, RDS, and Redshift. Also, you get to pay less by using more. You get volume-based discounts, for example, on Amazon S3. And as AWS grows their infrastructure, they will have some cost savings and they will pass them on to you. So AWS is very famous for doing cost reductions every month or every year, which is really good because as their infrastructure grow and more people use AWS, they have a volume and scale and therefore they will pass on that economy of scale onto you to get discounts. On top of it, in AWS, some services are going to be free and other will be part of the free tier. So IAM is free, VPC is free, and consolidated billing is free as well. If you use the Elastic Beanstalk, CloudFormation, and ASG, they are free services, but whatever these services create, obviously, you need to pay. So Elastic Beanstalk, if it creates an application balancer and an EC2 instance, it has to be paid by you. And your auto-scaling group, obviously, when it adds more EC2 instances, you're going to pay for those. And obviously, what is created through CloudFormation, you will have to pay as well. There's also a free tier that you can find at this address. And for example, as part of the free tier, you get a T2 micro instance for a year, or you get S3, EBS, ELB, and data transfer for free at up to a certain amount. Okay, so we have the free tier here, and we can see that there are kinds of free tier. There is featured, there is 12 months free, which is when you start a new account. There is always free, which is going to be free even after 12 months. And trials, for example, the 30-day trials for Guard Duty, for SageMaker, Inspector, and so on. So here, I think it's really helpful for you to have a look at it and to see what is free. I think the most important ones are going to be Amazon EC2, Amazon S3, Amazon RDS, and so on. So now let's do a deep dive into the pricing for different services. For example, for EC2, with the on-demand, you are only charge for what you use, which is the number of instances, as well as the instance configuration, what's the capacity, number of CPU and RAM, the region you're in, the operating system and the software you install on your EC2 instance, the instance type and instance size, and if you're using a load balancer, for example, how long the load balancer will run and the amount of data processed by your load balancer. Also, you can enable detailed monitoring on your EC2 instance to get CloudWatch metrics every minute instead of every five minutes, and you would have to pay for that as well. So now let's talk about the different models for pricing on EC2. The first one is with on-demand instances, and you're going to have a minimum billing time of 60 seconds, and then you're going to pay per second for Linux or per hour for your Windows EC2 instances. But if you know you're going to use your instances for a long time, then you should use reserved instances, and it's going to give you up to 75% discount compared to the on-demand price for the hourly rates. You need to commit for a long period of time, so either one or three year commitment, and you get more discounts if you pay early. So you can pay everything upfront and you get more discounts or partial upfront, so just a part of the total amount or no upfront, but this is going to give you a bit less discounts. You also have spot instances and you get up to 90% discounts compared to on-demand uh, hourly rates. And what this means is that you're going to bid for unused capacity in the EC2 instances. And so because you use this unused capacity, you can get it at a very, very aggressive discount. But with spot instances, you run the risk of losing them in case someone is willing to pay a bit more for your spot instances. You can also have dedicated hosts, which can be on demand and can be reserved as well. And this is a tenancy way of running EC2. This means that you are going to run alone on these hosts because they're dedicated to you. And finally, there's another component called savings plan, which is an alternative to all these things above. And I'm going to describe savings plans to you in a future lecture, so don't worry about it too much. Next, we have Lambda and ECS, again on the compute category. So Lambda, you pay per API call and you pay per duration of your Lambda functions times the number of the amount of RAM that you have assigned for your Lambda function. For ECS, you get an EC2 launch type model. That means that you don't get any fees for using ECS, but anytime you start an EC2 instance underlying your ECS cluster, then you will have to pay for that EC2 instance. For Fargate, it's a little bit different because we don't manage EC2 instances, and therefore we're going to pay for each container for the amount of CPU and memory that gets assigned for your container. 
Now let's talk about the pricing of the storage on Amazon S3. So as we saw, there are different storage classes that you need to know for the exam. We have S3 Standard, S3 Infrequent Access, S3 One Zone IA, S3 Intelligent Tiering, Glacier, and Glacier Deep Archive. As well, on S3, you're going to pay for the number and the size of the objects. And the prices can be tiered, so the more volume you have, the more objects and the more big and the bigger the objects are, the more discounts you're going to get. Then if you do request in and out of Amazon S3, you're going to pay for these requests. You're also going to pay for any data transfer out of the S3 region. So sending data into S3 is free, but retrieving data from S3, you will have to pay something. If you use S3 transfer acceleration, it is also a cost that has to be incurred for it. And any time you do a lifecycle transition between the storage classes defined above, then you're going to have to pay for it. A similar service is going to be EFS because EFS you're going to pay per use. It will also have an infrequent access tier and lifecycle rules. A different way to do storage pricing is with EBS. So with EBS, we're going to have pricing based on the volume type that we've provisioned. So the performance of that volume, then the size of the volume in gigabytes that you provision in advance. Okay, you don't pay per use with EBS. You say, yes, I want a 100 gigabyte EBS volume and you're going to pay for it regardless whether you use it or not. Then the IOPS, so the performance of your volume. So if it's a general purpose SSD, it's included, but if it's provision IOPS, you're going to pay for the IOPS you provision and for magnetic, the number of requests. Then you're going to pay for your EBS snapshots. So the more snapshots you get, the more you pay. So you're going to get data costs per gigabyte of snapshot per month. And then data transfer, any data transfer out of EBS is going to be paid and is going to be tiered for volume discount. But anything you write into EBS inbound is going to be free. Now let's talk about database pricing, for example, for RDS. So it's a per hour billing and based on the database you use, you have different pricing. So the engine type, the size, the memory class. Then for an RDS database, you can either have on demand as a purchase type or you can reserve an RDS database, which is a very smart thing to do, for example, for one or three years, and you can pay upfront for that RDS database. Then if you do RDS backups, you're going to have to pay for those, but usually there is no charge for backup storage, up to 100% of your total database storage for a region. And in the experience of AWS, that means that all in all, the backup storage should be free if your database is not all the way up to full. Then for RDS, you're going to pay obviously for the underlying storage in gigabytes per month based on the EBS volume that you provision for your RDS database. You're going to pay for the number of input and output requests per month, the deployment type, is it a single AZ or is it multi AZ, in which case you're going to pay for two RDS databases and as well as the data transfer. So any data transfer out of your database is going to be paid and tiered based on volume and any transfer into your database is free. Now let's talk about CloudFront. So CloudFront is a CDN and it is global. So therefore the pricing is going to be different based on where the CloudFront is served from. So you have different pricing based on usually continents. So for example, America, Europe, South America, Japan, Australia, India, and so on. And this is in the table that you can see in the slide down. And then the more you're going to use CloudFront in a specific edge location, the more you're going to get discounts and you're going to get an aggregated bill for all the edge locations. You're going to pay for any data transfer out of CloudFront, but not for in. In is always free. Finally, you're going to get a paid bill based on the number of requests that are made into CloudFront. They are counted. Okay, so in AWS, finally, you need to understand the networking costs, which are, to be honest, very, very complicated, but I try to simplify it in this slide. So you have a region and we have two AZ and say we have an EC2 instance in one AZ. Any traffic going inbound of your EC2 instance is going to be free. And then say you have another EC2 instance in the same AZ. If these two EC2 instance talk together, then the traffic is free using the private IP. Now say you have another EC2 instance in another AZ. Then if you use the public IP of the EC2 instances to talk to one another, then the traffic will have to go through the internet and you're going to pay two cents per gigabyte. But if you're using the private IP instead to make these EC2 instances talk to one another, then it's going to be one cent per gigabyte. So overall, I would recommend you always use the private IP if you can to have communication between your EC2 instances. And if you happen to have an EC2 instance in another region, then you're going to get a fee of two cents per gigabyte as an inter-region cost. Okay. So summary is that you should use a private IP instead of a public IP for good savings and better network performance. And then if possible, if you want to have the maximum amount of cost saving, 
use one availability zone, but you sacrifice obviously the high availability. So there's a trade-off here between cost and high availability. So that's it for an overview of pricing on AWS. You won't be testing on the actual details of each service, but it's good for you to understand the reasoning behind cost in AWS because this is what the exam will test you on to understand how at a high level it costs to use some AWS services. So hope you like this and I will see you in the next lecture.